What's up guys, we're going to talk about some Yonex rackets today. So, I get a lot of DMs about this kind of thing, and I actually realized that, you know, I, I know my family of Yonex rackets pretty well. I've tried most of them. Um, I've certainly tried a couple uh, from each line of these Yonex rackets. So we got the V-Core Pro on the left, all the way to the E-Zone on the right side. And the reason I have it laid out as, like this, you can see this little, you know, spectrum here. It's like, I feel like the V-Core series kind of sit in the middle, whereas the E-Zone is very much on the power side, and the V-Core Pro is much more on the feel control side. And, you know, it's a little bit oversimplified to just explain that much about the racket, but that's why I'm making this video. So we are going to elaborate on this spectrum a little bit so that you guys can maybe decide uh, which racket may or may not be better for you. So let's start with the V-Core Pro. That's a personal favorite. And this is Yonex's, you know, player's racket, I suppose. It has a lot of feel. It is extremely low power. It's very flexible, and it's probably one of the most comfortable rackets I've ever played with. And it also still feels and plays like a pretty modern racket. Like, you get good spin with this racket. No joke, you do. So the pros, easy control, stable, comfortable. And the downside is low power. I'm spelling it like that just to be an annoying person. But yeah, low power. And that is actually ultimately the reason that I decided not to get the V-Core Pro. Because I felt like it just took too much power away from my top end. Now, I'm a heavy hitter. And I get a lot of kill points with just raw power raw put away power and this racket takes a little bit too much of that away and i think a lot of players that are advanced and they hit really heavy and hard are going to notice how much of a sacrifice that actually is to have a racket that takes that much power away now one really common message that is sort of thrown around in the tennis community is that you need to learn how to generate your own power but nobody talks about learning how to generate your own control and that is something that i would like to encourage people to do is to Learn how to generate your own control. And if you're playing with a power racket, that's definitely the kind of thing you have to be more sensitive to. Whereas a racket like the V-Core Pro can make control very easy just because you swing a little bit harder, it doesn't necessarily seem like the ball goes any further. Like you have to kind of swing a lot to see a difference, which is why you can kind of be imprecise in how hard you're hitting the ball and the ball will still go pretty close to where you want it to go. There's a lot of reasons a racket like this can be really good. I'm actually recommending it to a beginner friend player of mine, um, somewhat of a student, but not necessarily. And I think when you're a beginner, it's annoying to have a racket where if you just tap the ball, it flies out of the court. So I'm getting her this racket partly because it's so comfortable, but also if you swing a little bit too hard, your ball might not necessarily fly out and it'll still go into play. So I feel like it creates like a large margin for forgiveness in terms of how hard you're going to hit the ball. And I would much rather a racket encourage you to swing more at the ball than a racket that encourages you to swing less at the ball, especially in the beginning stages of your tennis where you really want to get comfortable with some of the fundamental things like your swing path and whatnot. I don't want you to be afraid to hit the ball. I want you to be confident in hitting the ball. And on top of that, this is a racket that is so unlikely to cause you any arm problems. And you know, a racket that offers you a lot of control is desirable for many reasons across any level of tennis. So that's a racket that I'm recommending to her. I think your typical beginner's racket is actually terrible. Um, I might do a video on that, but uh, I can see why this would be such a nice racket for a beginner, even though it's not a traditional beginner's racket, and that's why I'm recommending it to her. It's also a pretty well-rounded racket. Like, you get good spin and all that. It's just, it's it's focus, I would say, or that what really separates it from the others is the fact that it is so comfortable and so control-oriented, again, with the downside being that it is very low power. So let's move on up to the V-Core 95. Now, you might notice that I have two V-Core rackets up here, and this one has a little bit of a blue glow effect going on. It's because the 95, I'm separating it from the V-Core series. So let me elaborate a little bit on why I'm separating these two. The V-Core is kind of supposed to be like the spin racket of the Yonex lineup, right? I hate to bring Babolat into compare because I don't want to use Babolat as like a reference point for every tennis brand, but you know, that's kind of how it is. Let's just be real. Um, I feel like the E-Zone is much more like a pure drive, but I don't feel like the V-Core is much like the pure arrow, if that makes sense. But it does have a more open string pattern than the E-Zone, so obviously it's marketed to be a little bit more spin friendly. So my point is, I think the main reason I'm gonna separate the V-Core 95 from the other V-Core rackets, such as the 98 and the 100 and so on, is because it doesn't really seem like it's marketed to be a spin friendly racket, whereas the other ones are. Like the V-Core 95 has a much smaller head, 
and it also has a more dense string pattern. Like not only did they make the head smaller than all the other V cores, they also added another string in the cross. So you got a 1620 situation with a V core 95 head size. And so when you make a racket head that much smaller and you make the string pattern that much more dense, how do you still call it a V core? That's kind of my question. I mean, you could make the argument that the V core pro gets way better spin than the V core 95 does. I mean, you know, th there's a V core pro uh, 18 by 20, but yeah, my point kind of remains the same. The V core 95 really stands out because it just doesn't really fit into the V core lineup. And a lot of people say this. It kind of feels like a V-Core, but it also kind of feels like a V-Core Pro, which is why I put it in this spectrum here. And it's so low powered. And I think its power level is much closer to the V-Core Pro than it is to the V-Core series in general. I know I have it up a little higher on this spectrum here, but honestly, like the power levels with the V-Core and the V-Core Pro, um, the 95 here, it's basically the same. Uh, I think, you know, let's do this. I'll talk about the pros and cons real quick. So the main benefit to getting this racket i think is the precision now the cost of that is that it is one it's very low powered the reason i have it a little bit higher up is because i think if you want to hit super hard this racket will still return some of that power whereas the v core pro will kind of just keep swallowing power it has a way of just like not allowing you to hit after a certain level of hitting hard. Whereas the Vcore 95, it's really hard to access your power, but sure enough, if you can actually swing fast enough, I feel like it will return the power so long as you can ask for it essentially. But the Vcore Pro just kind of is like, nope, no more power for you. Uh, the Vcore 95, if you're willing to work for it, you can still get it. And on that note, I think the Vcore 95 overall is just a high effort racket. Now it's not necessarily hard to swing. It's not that heavy but every decision that you make has to be done with a lot of precision and a lot of commitment because if you're a little bit soft when you're approaching the ball it might land way too short if you don't really load it up with spin it might not go in the court because you're not getting enough spin on it if you don't absolutely drive through the ball with maximum power output you really might not be able to put it away it's a very demanding racket and of all the rackets in the entire Yonex lineup, honestly, I think it's one of the most demanding. And it's not demanding on paper in the sense that it's really heavy and hard to swing. It's not that hard to swing, but you really got to be able to swing this thing to get what you want to get out of this racket. And even if you are able to get what this racket offers, I really feel like what it shines in is in precision. Um, and you might find that you're able to enjoy precision by other means with other rackets. Like for me, I'm a lot of my control and where I place the ball and how I shape my shots largely comes from how much spin I'm able to generate. So a lot of my aim comes from this sense of trajectory that I have as a tennis player who hits with a lot of uh, top spin. Like I can shape this shot. Like I might hit harder and really go for that corner, but I'm going to put so much spin on it that it's actually still going to drive in and then bounce way out. Like I can, I can do curve balls. I can do all kinds, of, all kinds of crazy stuff with spin that other rackets are more easily able to produce. And uh, the V quantity five just doesn't really deliver that. It, it's not really my kind of racket actually. Um, and it kind of frustrates me that this racket exists in the V core lineup because again, they make the head smaller and then they also make the string pattern more dense. Like you're doing two things that are changing it so much from what a V-Core I thought was supposed to be. And then on top of that, it's just such a hard racket to use. So I don't know. It's a strange one. I think it has a bit of a cult following, but like, I'm not really sure I'm a fan. I also learned very quickly with this racket that you're definitely going to want to string like seven to 10 pounds lower than you might on a lot of other rackets. Like if you're stringing in the mid to low fifties, I would string that same string on this racket, like six to seven, maybe even 10 pounds lower. So I'd start with this racket, start stringing it around like 45 pounds and see if you want to go down. I'd be surprised if you really want to go up. And that is if you're stringing with like polyester strings, if you're using multi-filaments and stuff, you know, that's a little different, but still, if you're using multis in one and you're going to use multis in this, I would still go down like six to 10 pounds less than whatever you are uh, used to stringing it in. So that's my spiel on the V core 95. It's rewarding in terms of precision, but it is so hard to use, and uh, <laughs> that racket might just kind of wear you down. But, you know, give it a shot if you're really curious, and you might love it. I just think it's a lot more effort than it's worth. All right, let's talk about the rest of the V-Core series. So you get good spin, and you get decent comfort, right? So it's not as comfortable as the V-Core Pro, which is, like, 
butter. It is like melted butter and pillows and all that good stuff, but it's still, you know, good feel. The V-Core series is kind of just, uh, I don't know, I'd say it's like average comfort levels. It's not great, but it's not terrible. It's not something that's going to just straight up give you tennis elbow, but if you do have tennis elbow problems, I'm not going to recommend the V-Core necessarily. It's like, well, maybe you might be all right. I'd certainly recommend it for comfort over the E-Zone, but I wouldn't put it in the comfort category. Does that make sense? So it's not bad. And it never gave me any arm issues, but you know, I know some people are sensitive to that. And the string pattern is a little bit more open than the E-Zone, for example. And I think it's a little more open than the V-Core Pro Series. It, you know, the V-Core Pro Series has a couple that are like 18 by 20, um, and you got a 97 in there. So I, I still think though that the V-Core 98, the string pattern, it looks a little bit more open than the V-Core 97 does actually. So it's very close. But the V-Core uh, 98 and the 100 are definitely marketed to be a little bit more on the spin-friendly side. And if you look at the string pattern, that'll pretty much make sense to you. And when you hit the ball, um, it doesn't have the same kind of stability that uh, a lot of the other rackets offer you. It definitely wants to kind of flop over the ball a little bit more than the E-Zone series do. And one of these days I'll show you guys this in some videos and stuff. I've watched this online, but if you ever look at a slow-mo shot of like Nadal hitting a good forehand, the racket makes contact with the ball and then it kind of flops over the ball and continues to follow over. And honestly, if you guys want to hit really nasty topspin, you guys, you guys can't just do this windshield wiper motion where you go up like that on the ball. Like, I think you guys also know that if you're, the better you are at tennis, the more you find ways to have time on the ball. And when you're hitting with a lot of topspin, you got to follow the trajectory of the ball. Like you can't just chop over it like this. The whole windshield wiper thing, that's kind of a misnomer. You gotta be able to come up and really curl over the ball. You get more time on the ball if you come on top of it and continue to brush through the ball. And a racket like the V-Core doesn't have the same stability at the three and nine. Like there's less weight, there's less twist weight. You can look it up. Um, Tennis Warehouse has a thing for, for a database for that kind of thing, but it's twist weight is lower. And one of the benefits is that of that is it actually does allow you to sort of trace or brush over the ball further into your stroke, whereas a racket like the E-Zone is more so designed to continue penetrating through the ball. And that's what happens with weight on the 3 and 9. The weight on the 3 and 9 is literally there to stabilize the racket, whereas if you're brushing over the ball, that is something that is destabilizing the racket, right? I hope that makes sense. And I will do a video on that sometime, just kind of analyzing the mechanics of what happens with the racket and the ball, specifically on Nadal, since he's kind of like the go-to top spin guy. So yeah, pros and cons of the V-Core series. I think I covered that good spin, decent comfort, and slightly stiff, but I can't say that it's a stiff racket necessarily, and I also wouldn't put it in the comfort category. It's pretty average. All right, on to the E-Zone, the last in our series here, and mm, maybe the most popular in the Yonex lineup. I'm not exactly sure. It probably depends, but I think it's safe to say. Now, I don't know if everybody knows this. Let me know in the comments if you didn't or if you did, but I am very curious. Did you guys know that the Yonex E-Zone is literally marketed as EZ1? E-Z-O-N-E. It just stands for EZ1. I never knew that. Um, I've been saying that a couple videos ago, but... Uh, yeah, when I first found that out, it kind of blew my mind, and I was just like, does everyone know that except me? Um, so this racket is designed to give you easy power, and I definitely feel that, and that is also one of the cons. I'll get to that later. And it's a very stable racket. Like, this racket is good at blocking and penetrating through heavy balls. Like, this racket will go through them pretty well if you, uh, you know, if you're ready to do that. This racket will deliver with stability and plow through. It's very solid in that regard. Like, it will go through those balls and serves and, and ground strokes and all that stuff, you get good power with this racket. Easy access to power for sure. And again, I don't like to bring Babolat into the picture too much, but they are kind of the biggest of the big names. And yeah, this is essentially the pure drive of the Yonex world. But I think it might be a little bit more comfortable. It might be a little bit more control oriented. Um, and in some ways, I actually feel like it might be a little bit higher power than the pure drive, which is kind of hard to believe, but that's sort of my experience. So yeah, easy power, stable. Those are the pros. Let me talk about the cons real quick. So this is what, this is a racket back in the day when I was searching for rackets. I had the plus version. I had the plus 98. I was really trying to like this racket and I actually did in a lot of ways. The power was awesome. A lot of my friends noticed they liked how my balls were coming off the racket. Um, they told me that and I could see it, like the power was there, but the control wasn't necessarily, and, and also the feel wasn't. And I kept 
stringing my tension up and higher and I went to like almost 60 pounds, which I don't like to do with polyester strings. And I think what I ultimately did was uh, I switched to 16 gauge. I think I was using 17 for a long time and I switched to 16 because I thought, well, maybe that'll take a little more power off. And, it, and honestly, it still didn't. And the racket felt a little bit stiffer and my sense of feel and sensation went down a little bit too. Um, not that it was very good on that racket in the first place. Like, I think the most common complaint about this racket is that it's too powerful and a lot of people also say that it doesn't have great feel. So on top of that, it is stiff. I guess you could categorize this as a racket that may or may not cause arm, arm problems, but I think if your technique is good and you know, you're letting the weight of the racket and stuff cooperate with your tennis and stuff. I don't really see why you'd get arm problems, but you know, if you have arm problems, this is this is not the racket to get, unless you want to make your arm problems worse. It's a tough racket to know who to recommend it to because the thing with like advanced players is that advanced players could use any of these rackets. It's just a matter of which one is going to be that blend of compromise and uh, sacrifice, but also like complements the things that they want in their game. I honestly feel like the least likely one to be the type of racket I'd recommend to the higher level players, the really heavy hitters, is possibly something from the V-Core Pro lineup. And I know that doesn't sound intuitive, but uh, I don't really see that racket out there, but I also don't think that a lot of the higher level players would appreciate how much power it actually takes away. And again, the more advanced players, like they, they're not just real able to hit the absolute you know what out of the ball. They're also, they, they got good hands. Like they're able to generate their own control and their own angles and be in control of the depth and all that stuff on the ball. So they don't maybe need a racket that does that for them. I feel like the V-Core Pro does a lot of that for the player that doesn't have a sense of what happens when you hit it slightly harder. Um, the V-Core Pro will kind of water those decisions down, whereas like the E-Zone will exaggerate those decisions. So just like the slightest difference in your head angle or the slightest difference in power, like your ball might lit literally like fly out of the court sometimes. And that would happen to me. I remember on so many shots that would happen to me and I just look at my racket like, yo, what the hell? Like, what the hell was that? Yeah, and eventually that just happened too many times. I was just like, dude, I'm done with this racket. I can't do this. This, this racket just has too much power. It's ridiculous. And I can't, I don't have a sense of like, you know? And I was using 16 gauges at the time, and I don't know, I was, I was messing around with the V-Core Pro, or no, sorry, I was messing around with the V-Core and the E-Zone at the time, so, you know, impressions were probably a little bit disoriented, but I spent a long time with the E-Zone, and I did spend a long time with the V-Core, um, and I ultimately ended up on a completely different racket that is nothing like any of these rackets, and that makes perfect sense because I never found a home with any of these, but I did get to know these rackets well. I did, and yeah. I got a solid foundation understanding of their pros and cons, and I think what kind of players would be attracted to the qualities in these rackets. So, yeah, that's what I'll say. Yonex has great uh, quality control, right? Because they're all made in-house. They're one of the only brands that does anything in-house. Like, Yonex makes their rackets in Japan. Everyone else makes their rackets in China. They're, like, designed in one country um, and then manufactured in China. Which is fine, but, you know, China uh, is more so designed to do, like, mass production stuff, at least, you know, not China as a whole, but, you know, the factories that these rackets are getting made at, they're really designed to maximize output. And look, I'll tell you one more thing about a brand like Yonex versus a brand like Babolat. A brand like Babolat is giving tons and tons of millions of dollars to Nadal and, and several other players. They spend a lot of money on endorsements and advertisements, and for sure, a lot of your money is going to pay for that. So they have to cut corners somewhere. So they can't afford necessarily to take an extra however long it takes to make sure that the racket specs are a little bit closer to what they're advertised to be because that's going to raise the cost of production a lot and that's going to eat into the profits a lot so they either have to raise the cost to make a small difference in something that most consumers aren't going to notice and that's probably going to hurt their sales so you know they've found a balance between quality control and pricing that works for their brand and i think yonex doesn't spend that kind of money i think you know their highest paid player i i don't know for sure but it's probably warinka it might be Shapovalov. I don't know, but it's it's one of those guys, and maybe that depends on the year. But Yonex has definitely grown a lot as a brand, but they haven't really compromised on their quality control, and that, that says a lot for Yonex. And I think if you can find a Yonex racket that you're really happy with, that would be great because their quality control is really good. And, you know, when I bought my Blade 104, I went to the racket shop and balanced several rackets, and I found one Wilson that 
I think it was like six or seven points more head heavy than the other Wilsons, um, the other Blade 104s that I measured, which is a huge discrepancy. But, you know, that's Wilson for you. That's Babolat for you, etc. That is not Yonex. So, you know, I, I didn't find a Yonex that I liked necessarily um, enough to commit to it and switch to it. But I do respect them for their quality control, for sure. And, and you know, these rackets are legit. They're really good. It's just a matter of me... I didn't find one that worked for me. I'm doing weird stuff, uh, you know. <laughs> I did a video on my racket. It's it's literally like modified in 28 inches, and you can check it out. Um, I'll link it somewhere up here. So if you want to see more about my Blade 104 and a custom paint job I'll be doing on it, you can check out that content too. But that is the Yonex video. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Let me know if you have any questions and comments, and I will see you guys in a future video. If you want to check out stuff from my clothing brand i'm always repping it in my videos you can check out the instagram at isn't.co this design means time isn't money because time is priceless that is the idea but i'm not here to tell you what time is i'm just tell you i'm just here to tell you what it isn't um, but there's other designs too and i got some dampeners which are very nice if i may say so myself obviously i have a little bias but you know I generally don't bother making something unless I can do a really good job making it. So if you want a legit dampener, you want to support the brand, you can DM me on Instagram at isn't.co and you can DM me at my time for tennis Instagram, which is time for tennis. All right. Thanks for watching. Let me know what rackets you guys are using and uh, let me know what you guys are looking for in a racket. I'm just curious what kind of, uh, what kind of players we got watching this stuff. I'll also, you know, I, I do polls and stuff so you guys can keep an eye out for that. I'll be asking questions and you can answer there. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in a future video. Subscribe.